This is Bregenz in Austria. It's an incredibly attractive town located on the shores of Lake Constance and one can walk from here both into Germany and Switzerland. In the distance one can see the Alps. It is noted for its music festivals and has an open air stage directly on the lake. It was here that Ianfried Eber, the most prolific mass murdering doctor of all time, came into the world on the 8th of September 1910. It is strange to think that such a similar attractive location also gave birth to the man who succeeded Ianfried Eber as commandant of Treblinka. Franz Stangl. Stangl was born in Altmunster, located on the shores of Lake Traunsee in the Salzkammergut region of Austria. Nearly all of the Nazi mass murderers came from a Catholic background. However, Abel was Protestant, both of his parents having converted from Catholicism to Protestantism because of their German national sentiments. As so it seemed to them the Catholic Church seemed to be too obedient to Rome. The family was thoroughly racist. His parents were followers of the crackpot racist conspiracy theories of Georg Schoner, which Hitler also referred to in Mein Kampf. His father, Franz Ebel, was an engineer working as a trade inspector in the Austrian civil service who lost his job because of his Nazi connections. Both of his two brothers were also keen supporters of the Nazi party. From 1928, Abel studied Edison at the University of Innsbruck. On the 8th of December 1931, he joined the Nazi party, membership number 687095. He was also a member of the fencing fraternity Germania Innsbruck, which belonged to the Conservative Students' Union Weisse Kreis. From the summer semester of 1932 until the dissolution of the German student body in Innsbruck in May 1933, he was head of the Office for Physical Exercise on behalf of the National Socialist German Student Union. In January 1933, he was elected to the Innsbruck Student Chamber as a representative of the National Socialist German Student Union. He also belonged to SA Storm Group 14. Following an outbreak of terrorism by the Nazis, the party was banned in Austria on the 20th of June 1933. In February 1935, he qualified as a medical practitioner and worked as an assistant doctor in the Rudolf Foundation Hospital in Vienna and at the Grimstein Lung Sanatorium. He later claimed that his Nazi party membership prevented permanent employment in Austria, so he went to Germany in 1936. After a brief employment at the German Hygiene Institute in Dresden, in the Office for Public Welfare in Dessau, in the Birkenhag Lund Sanatorium in Berlin-Lichtenrade, and at the Berlin Medical Emergency Services, Abel switched to the main health office in Berlin as a scientific researcher. On the 23rd of June 1938, he married Ruth Rehm, a fervent Nazi from Ulm, who was three years older than he. She worked as a department head in the Women's Office of the German Labour Front and as a district administrator for the Foreign Organisation of the Labour Front. In this role she had significant influence as well as access to funds. Despite having no background in psychiatry, he used his contacts in the Nazi party to get himself the job of being the head of the Brandenburg Clinic, which was to be used as a murder facility of the Nazi euthanasia program. This was the program in which the Nazis got rid of those people that they considered not worthy of life. In January 1940, he took part in the first trial gassing of sick people in the Brandenburg Sanatorium. 
On the 1st of February 1940, Ebel got an official job at the Non-Profit Foundation for Institutional Care, a cover name of the T4 organisation which was to kill those people the Nazis considered useless eaters, such as the mentally and physically challenged. This was what the Nazis termed euthanasia. Thus, he started his career in killing, this time as the head of the Nazi murder centre in Brandenburg. There, when he was on site, he was present for all the gassings himself. His pocket diary survived, and he meticulously noted the sex of the victims, their ethnic origins, such as a J if they were Jewish. The first gassing of a Jewish group took place on the 10th of July 1940. This contradicts the evidence of Victor Brack, who was head of the euthanasia killings, who said that Jews were not specially marked out for murder in this operation. The Brandenburg Clinic was closed in October 1940, having taken the lives of 9,722 people. Ebel then took over as head of the newly established Bernberg Killing Center and moved there with the staff from the Brandenburg Clinic. On the 21st of November 1940, killings commenced at Bernberg. Here, at the gas chamber designed and built by Erwin Lambert. As a trained doctor, Ebel objected to some of the excuses given as the cause of death. For example, noting that writing tuberculosis was suspicious as people did not generally just drop down dead from this disease as it takes a while to set in. During this time, as head of the Bernberg facility, 8,601 people were murdered. Like many who were later involved in the Holocaust in Poland, Ebel ceased to work in the T4 program in August 1941. After that, he appears to have been employed in the Organisation Tod in the occupied Soviet Union in a medical capacity in the care and transport of the wounded to hospitals at the rear. From here, he was moved to Aktion Reinhardt, the murder of the Polish Jews. He was appointed to be head of the planned Treblinka death camp in April 1942. Mass murders of Polish Jews by gassing had started at Helmut nad Nerem on the 7th of December 1941 and at Bełżec in March 1942. On the 24th of April 1942, he was at Sobibor, where the camp appears to have been built but was not yet operational. There he witnessed a trial gassing organised by Christian Wirt. As we know from Gitte Sereni's interviews with future Treblinka commandant Franz Stangel in her book Into That Darkness, he must have met Stangel there although neither mentioned the name of the other later. In May 1942, work on construction of the Treblinka death camp began. At this time, he was in Warsaw, under the command of SS and police leader Friedrich Wilhelm Kruger. Ebel sought to impress, and he appears to have done so by completing the camp ahead of schedule. At the end of June 1942, he wrote to his wife that he'd been very busy trying to get everything ready to meet his deadline for the construction of the camp and that he was about to move to what he called T. His address there would be SS Untersturmführer Dr. Ebel, Treblinka by Malkinia, SS Sonderkommando. The deportation of people from the Warsaw Ghetto to the death camp at Treblinka began on the 22nd of July 1942, with the victims being murdered the following day. On the 30th of July 1942, with tens of thousands already murdered, Ebel wrote once more to his wife to say that he needed 100 hours to the day to complete his tasks. 
The next four weeks were the most prolific killing spree at one location in world history to that date and only surpassed by the amount of victims at Auschwitz-Birkenau in the late spring of 1944. The Nazi fanatism of Ebel was such that he wanted to impress by the number of victims he killed. However, he forgot the rest of the organisation of the camp. When the victims of the T4 killings arrived, they were deceived by the pleasant surroundings. It is clear that Nazis wanted to do the same with the death camps. They wanted to make their victims believe that they had arrived at a transit camp where they'd be looked after and to that end needed to disguise what was going on. For example, later, the station at Treblinka was made to look like a real station. The camps were decorated with flowers and plants and everything needed to look clean and neat. The object was to make the victims realise as late as possible that they were going to be killed. This did not happen during Ebel's time at Treblinka. Poland in August is hot. Whereas the distance from Warsaw to Treblinka is only around 80 kilometres, people were packed into the trains very tightly, without water and standing up. There was little air, particularly for those in the centre of the carriages. Trains were delayed, sometimes stuck on sidings for long periods of time. When the wagons arrived, large numbers were already dead. Then the corpses were often just unloaded and left to rot in the sun. The same happened with those who were murdered in the gas chambers. Their bodies were left to rot in the roasting sun. Ebel was unable to dispose of the dead. Thousands of corpses lay around the entire camp area. The camp personnel could no longer keep up with the burials in mass graves. The stench of rotting flesh was felt for kilometres around. When the victims were forced into the ghetto, those that could transferred as much of their wealth as possible into valuables which we could be carried around with them, such as currency, coins, valuable metals or diamonds. These valuables were found on the corpses and black marketeers flocked to Treblinka knowing that the guards had goods to trade with them. Discipline had completely broken down. It did not take long for the Operation Reinhardt leadership in Lublin to find out. On 26th of August 1942, Odilo Globochnik, head of Operation Reinhardt, and Christian Wirt, Inspector General of the Death Camps, together with Wirt's driver, Josef Oberhauser, arrived for a snap, unannounced inspection. What happened next, we know from the post-war interrogation of Josef Oberhauser in West Germany. It was a hot August day and the whole camp area smelt of rotting flesh because of the corpses lying around everywhere. Globochnik didn't even bother to enter the camp to look around, but stayed in front of the commandant's barracks, sent for Dr. Abel, and greeted him with these words. How is it possible to allow so many more thousands to be transported here if only two to three thousand can be processed per day? Ebel was dismissed from his post as commandant and stayed in Treblinka just long enough for him to show the new commandant, Frank Stangl, around the camp. Ebel was then back on duty in Bernberg. Killing ceased here in July 1943. Ebel was called up for the military on the 31st of January 1944. His former colleagues from Operation Reinhardt were then based in Trieste, in Italy, and it seems he wanted to go here too. This was not permitted. On the 1st of July 1944, he was in Slovakia. Documentary evidence exists that he was permitted to purchase foreign currency for a business trip on behalf of the Reich government. The following month, his wife died at the age of 37. By the winter of 1944, he was in Luxembourg as a military doctor in the Panzergrenadier Lehr Regiment 902 during the Battle of the Bulge. He was captured by the Americans, given work in the tuberculosis ward in a POW camp and released with other former soldiers on the 6th of July 1945. Although he continued to use his real name, he was not recognised as being part of that organisation 
nor was he wanted for crimes related to the T4 programme or Treblinka. The parents of his deceased wife came from Blaubeuren in Swabia and he settled there. He was able to reinstate his medical practitioner's licence and worked there as a family doctor. He met Gerda P, who was to become a second wife. She was unaware of his background. He claimed to anyone who asked that he had worked in the health insurance office in Berlin from 1937 until he was called up for the army. In the summer of 1947, the Stuttgart Public Prosecutor's Office was informed by the American military authorities of a doctor who was resident in Blaubeuren who had the same name as the former head of the euthanasia facility in Bernberg. On the 8th of December 1947, he was questioned by both American and German agencies, but this did not provide any clarification. They contacted the public prosecutor's office in the Soviet-occupied Bernberg. On the 30th of December 1947, a request was made from Bernberg that Ebel be formally arrested. He was detained on the 8th of January 1948, although it was still not possible to clarify his identity. A female nurse from the Grafenek Killing Centre was shown Ebel's photograph by the State Criminal Police Office in Tübingen on the 9th of February 1948. She correctly identified Ebel. On the 15th of February 1948, a fellow prisoner talked to Ebel about the book De SS Staat by Eugen Kogon. Eugen Kogon had opposed the Nazis and spent six years in Buchenwald as a prisoner as a result. His book was one of the very first detailed accounts of the concentration camp system and those that ran it. It was written from the middle of June to the middle of December 1945 and in its first German language edition sold more than half a million copies. This was probably the reason Ebel decided to commit suicide. He realised he wasn't going to get away with it, that his identity would soon be revealed and that he had probably very little chance of avoiding a trial which possibly could end in a death sentence which then still existed in the western part of Germany. He could have been put on trial by either the Americans or the Germans. On the 16th of February 1948, he hanged himself in his prison cell in Ulm. At this point in time, the investigating authorities still had no confirmation of the dead remand prisoner's true identity. Thank you for listening. There's a lot more related to the Holocaust on this channel. If you're interested, then you may wish to subscribe. Videos are published at 8 in the evening on Fridays, Central European time.